The brutal massacre of the Tan children in 1979 is a chilling tale that has haunted Singapore for decades. A seemingly ordinary family was thrust into a nightmare when the four children of Tan Quan Chai and Li Mei Ying were savagely murdered while their parents were at work. In an era where technological advancements in crime investigation were far from today's standards, the limitations of the time contributed to the case going cold. Let's delve into today's case, the Geylang Baru family murders. The Tan family consisted of a couple and their four children. They lived in an HDB public housing flat at Block 58, Geylang Baru in Kalang, Singapore. The family was known to be happy and rarely had any disputes among themselves or with their neighbors. Sadly, this once happy family would become the target of the most heinous crime Singapore has ever heard of. It was the early morning of January 6, 1979, Tan Quan Chai, 38 years old, and Li Mei Ying, 30 years old, woke up early, around 6 a.m., and took a glance at their four sleeping children. The eldest was 10-year-old Tan Kok Peng, and 8-year-old was Tan Kok Yin, and 6-year-old was Tan Kok Soon, and the youngest was 5-year-old Tan Chin Ni. Both of the couple had to start their day early because they ran a minibus service to transport children to their schools. Approximately at 6.35 a.m., the couple left after planting a kiss on each of their children's foreheads before heading out to start the day. After working for a bit, Li Mei Ying phoned the house as an alarm at 7.10 a.m. for the children to wake up for school. Strangely, there was no answer. This was strange because the Tan children were quite well behaved and sensible. They would get themselves up and get ready for school on their own. Perhaps several more phone calls would do to wake them up, which Li decided to make twice. Still, there was no answer. Concerned that her children would be late for school, Lee called her neighbor and asked if they could knock on the door of their flat to wake the children up. The unnamed neighbor agreed and approached the Tan family's door. The neighbor knocked repeatedly, but strangely, there was no rustling to open the door. The neighbor informed Lee of the futile effort and both assumed perhaps the children had woken up early and gone to school. Around 10 a.m., the job of commuting children was done, and the couple headed back to their house, still with the assumption that their children had gone to school. However, as they stepped into the bathroom of the flat, they were greeted with a grisly sight that would forever be embedded in their minds. It was horrifying, and the police were called. They found the bodies of their four children piled on top of each other in the bathroom. The children, still dressed in the t-shirts and pants from their pajamas, were brutally murdered in a way that nobody could imagine. Slash wounds were visible on their bodies, and the scene was so bloody that the mother almost fainted. An on-the-spot autopsy concluded that each of the children has sustained at least 20 slashes from head to toe. It was also reported that the youngest child, Tan Chin Ni, had been slashed multiple times on the face. On the other hand, the eldest, Tan Kok Peng, had his right arm almost completely severed from his body. In his hand were strands of hair indicating that he had tried to fight back, but was slashed mercilessly. The sheer brutality was completely inhumane for everyone to see. Even when interviewed, both Tan Quan Chai and Li Mei Ying were shocked and stricken with terror as they wept together hysterically. The neighbors and relatives supported the mother who seemed overwhelmed. It was a pain no parent should ever go through. Soon, the police secured the murder scene, and hundreds of people also surrounded the place out of curiosity. The police struggled to keep people from entering the scene as they didn't want any evidence to be trampled on by the people. The acting deputy of the homicide squad of the Criminal Investigation Department, Gan Boon Lung, arrived at the scene along with senior forensic pathologist, Dr. Chao Tzu Cheng. The bodies were taken to the mortuary after each member of the newspaper team had taken pictures for the report. The police then screened the Tan family's flat for evidence. Now, this is where things started to look weird. 
they noticed that there was no sign of forced entry, either through the door or the window. If we were talking about a robbery gone fatal, there would be things missing from the house. Yet the items in the flat and even the children's school bags were left untouched. If there was no forced entry, that means only one thing. The police speculated that perhaps the children had opened the door to someone they knew. This speculation grew stronger when they looked at the time frame of the murder, which could be said to be from the moment the parents went to work until before the neighbor came knocking. The investigators found traces of blood around the kitchen and in the sink, indicating that the perpetrator attempted to clean as much blood as possible from themselves. Although no weapon was found, forensic results suggested it could have been a meat chopper or a dagger. However, it was puzzling how someone could attack four children without anyone in the area hearing screams. Interestingly, an elderly lady named Yam Yin Ting, who lived in the same flat and often sat in the corridor watching the children play, claimed she did not hear any commotion from the Tan's flat that morning as she was washing her hair. Other neighbors also claimed they didn't hear anything unusual that morning. Given the neighbors' claims of not hearing anything, the police suspected there might have been at least two murderers, one who would bring a child into the bathroom for the killing, while the other distracted the remaining children before their turn. This theory also suggested that the murderers were familiar with the Tan couple's routine and had planned the timing of their attack accordingly. During the investigation, the police interrogated over 100 individuals, including the Tan family's relatives, neighbors, and public members who responded to appeals for witnesses. Unfortunately, this effort seemed largely futile, as no specific leads were found. Instead, the police encountered numerous hoaxes circulating about the Tan couple. Some residents in the area had claimed to have seen Tan Chin Ni, the youngest daughter, fighting with a man in another block where the said residents lived. However, this claim was quickly dismissed as the witness could not be located. Still, the police felt it was necessary to investigate the background of the Tan couple. Li Meying's brother claimed that the couple had been involved in a tontine scheme, a system of mutual life insurance where benefits are received by surviving participants. It involves several members, with one serving as the banker responsible for recording transactions during monthly meetings. The remaining members are subscribers who contribute money or assets and receive shares over time. If the subscribers die, the surviving members received increased benefits. The police considered a disgruntled gambler as a potential suspect, but found no leads. The Tan family denied this claim. If someone aimed to harm due to the Tontine scheme, it would likely target the parents, not the children, as killing children does not guarantee more shares unless a group member is eliminated. The police also explored the possibility that the murderers could be gamblers or gang members focused on money. They considered that the Tan couple might have accumulated a debt they couldn't pay, angering these individuals and prompting them to seek revenge. However, the Tan couple denied ever offending anyone, even financially. Despite this, the police believed the murderers had carefully planned their attack, classifying it as a premeditated murder case. A witness, whom the Straits Times labeled as a prankster, shared his account with the media. He claimed to have seen a man and a woman leaving the scene shortly after the estimated time of the murder. One of the individuals was reportedly covered in blood, and both were acting suspiciously. However, investigators dismissed this testimony as a hoax. Despite the challenges, the police continued their investigation. On January 7th, they brought in two women for questioning. It was unclear who these women were and what their connection was to the murder, but the police hoped they could provide more information about the incident. However, the women were released shortly after and the police did not confirm whether they obtained any leads from them. Following the news of the massacre, parents in Singapore, especially in HDB flat block 58, were in a state of constant paranoia. Fearing their children might be lured away by someone suspicious, parents never let their children out of sight. 
they walked their children to school and picked them up afterward. Doors were locked, and children were instructed not to open the door when home alone. In a particularly eerie twist, two weeks after the massacre, the Tan couple received a New Year's card. The card featured a picture of happy children playing and a taunting note written in Chinese saying, now you have no more offspring, ha ha ha. The note also referred to Tan Quen Chai and Li Mei Ying by their personal nicknames, A Chai and A Eng, and was signed the murderer. Li Mei Ying had undergone sterilization after the birth of Tan Qian Ni. The perpetrator must have been close enough to know about Li Meng's inability to bear more children. Moreover, the use of Chinese nicknames, typically reserved for close friends or family, suggested that the act was committed by someone well acquainted with the family. This belief was shared by both the public and investigators. Sometime later, investigators received a tip from an unnamed taxi driver from Toapayo. The driver reported that a man, appearing to be in his 20s, had staggered to his taxi parked at Block 96 along Kalangbaru Road around 8 a.m. on that fateful morning. This location was not far from the Tan family's flat. The taxi driver continued his testimony, stating that the man had blood stains on the left side of his clothing and body. Concerned for the man's well-being, the driver allowed him into the taxi. The man requested to be dropped off at Lavender Street. As he exited the taxi, the driver noticed the man was carrying a knife, which clanged against the car door. Acting on this testimony, the police swiftly worked to identify the suspicious man. Tan Quen Chai spoke with the taxi driver and concluded that they had a matching description of the suspicious man. The Tan family knew a neighbor as uncle who frequently visited to borrow their phone. The police theorized that if this man visited often, he would be recognized by the children and familiar with the family's schedule. The police arranged a lineup of several neighbors for the taxi driver to identify. The driver quickly recognized one man who was then arrested by the police. However, this man, uncle, a Malaysian, was released two weeks later due to insufficient evidence linking him to the massacre. The uncle and his sister subsequently moved out of Block 58, possibly to escape media attention and public scrutiny. The Tan children were buried in Chua Chu Kang Cemetery on January 7, 1979. They were dressed in their best clothes and buried with their school bags and beloved toys. Lee fainted multiple times as her children were laid to rest in their respective burial spots. Their grandmother was seen grieving heavily as she placed the children's belongings in the graves with them. The ordeal was profoundly devastating for the Tan relatives and the entire nation of Singapore as the murderer remains at large to this day. Various theories arose in the aftermath of the tragic incident, further compounding the grieving family's pain. One theory suggested that Li Mei Ying had an affair with uncle, and when she refused to leave her family for him, he killed her children in a fit of rage. Another theory revolved around money. A relative of Li had reportedly asked her to purchase lottery tickets, which ended up winning $45,000. However, Lee claimed to have forgotten to buy the tickets, leading to speculation that the relative, believing Lee was withholding the prize money, killed the children in a vengeful act before fleeing the country. Yet another widely believed theory among locals, according to a YouTube commenter, implicated Uncle in the murder. The theory suggests that Uncle asked the Tan couple to buy 4D lottery tickets for him. When his chosen number won, he went to the Tans to collect his winnings, but was told they had forgotten to buy the tickets. Angered and disbelieving, Uncle became convinced the Tans had kept his winnings when they bought mini school buses for their transport business. In revenge, he murdered their children to end their bloodline, knowing Mrs. Tan had undergone sterilization. Another theory suggested the Tan couple's involvement in drug activities and their reluctance to report uncle for fear he would expose them. In Singapore, drug-related offenses carried the death penalty. 
the couple vehemently denied all these theories. According to theories, locals believed Uncle was responsible for the children's murder, but remained silent due to his street gang affiliation. This theory suggests the grandmother falsely claimed to be washing her hair that day to avoid being targeted. Despite numerous theories, the couple consistently and vehemently denied all of them. The Tan couple ceased operating their minibus service to transport children to school, expressing in a newspaper interview their fear of endangering other children if the killer was targeting them. They subsequently began working at a PVC bag machining factory. Despite the pain of living in the flat where their children were murdered, Tan Quen Chai and Li Mei Ying remained there, missing their children deeply. They applied for adoption at the Ministry of Social Affairs, hoping for a boy and a girl, but no children were available. In 1981, Li Mei Ying underwent reversal sterilization surgery and gave birth to a healthy boy on December 30th, 1983. The numerous theories surrounding the case, which accused the Tan couple of infidelity, greed, and involvement in drug crimes, could not be proven and only added to their pain. With no progress, the investigation eventually went cold. In April 2021, nearly 43 years after the murders, Crime Library Singapore, CLS, a non-profit established in 2000, revisited the case. CLS specializes in soliciting witnesses for murder and cold cases, locating missing persons, reuniting biological families. During a charity drive focused on unsolved cases and crime prevention, they gathered valuable information about the case. CLS's small investigation revealed that Li Mei Ying's real name is Li M C, and she was not born in Singapore. They also corrected the crime scene's location from level 4, as reported by many media outlets, to level 5. CLS believed that the family's neighbors had withheld crucial information and sought to interview them, although they had since moved away. While CLS's new information could not be verified, it rekindled hopes of solving the crime 42 years later. Shin Min Daily News informed the still-living Li Mei Ying that the investigation had resumed. The 73-year-old was tearful upon hearing the news. Although she wanted to leave the past behind, her hope for justice for her children was evident. Sadly, it was also revealed that Tan Quen Chai had passed away, and Li Mei Ying believed he shared her wish for justice. The harrowing tale of the Tan children's massacre remains one of Singapore's most haunting unsolved mysteries. Progress on the case has been slow, with many neighbors having moved or passed away, and the flat having been demolished, continuing the investigation is challenging. Despite decades passing, enduring pain for the surviving family members, and numerous theories that have surfaced and subsequently faded away, the quest for justice has never completely ceased. As the years go by, the chances of solving this case grow slimmer, yet the memory of the innocent Tan children and the hope for justice continue to resonate, a reminder of the enduring human spirit in the face of tragedy. Anyone with information about the case is encouraged to contact Crime Library Singapore. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.